Hi guys, and welcome back to another video where I share with you what I've been learning on my journey of chess improvement. Today, we're gonna to be talking about a strategic concept that you can use to better guide your middle game plans and to achieve positional advantages that are going to hopefully yield you more wins in your games. So that concept that we're gonna be discussing is weak squares, not to be confused with weak colors, which I will be making a separate video on. Weak squares. This is something that has come up many times when I talk to stronger players about what differentiates them from a weaker player as something that is not thoroughly understood by lower rated players. Square weaknesses are at the core of a lot of plans for the stronger players. Sometimes entire games will revolve around a square weakness, and we are going to look at some examples of what that looks like in some master games here in this video. But what is a weak square? A weak square is a square that cannot be protected by any pawns and therefore can serve as a basically springboard for your opponent to use in their attack. So let's take it to the board and I will show you what I mean. We have a position here. Obviously, there are no pieces in this position. The reason for that is because pawns are the determiner of which squares on the board are weak. And you've probably heard the expression, every pawn push leaves behind weaknesses and that pawns can't move backwards. And this is something that's very important to understand when you're trying to better understand how to use your pawns and when to move them and when not to. So pawns are the ones that determine which squares are going to be weak. So we are going to look at a pawn structure here and determine what the weak squares are. So keeping in mind the definition, a square that cannot be protected by any pawns, take a second to figure out which squares are weaknesses for white. Go ahead and pause the video if you need to. So the weak squares for white are b4, c4, d4, e3, and g3. And the reason these are weak is because we no longer have pawns that can push to defend these squares. So these are going to be permanently weak throughout the entire game. Now take a second and see if you can figure out which squares are weak for black. We can go ahead and flip the board. <laughs> so the weak squares for black are b6, d5, and temporarily g4. As long as this pawn here remains on f5, we will not be able to push our pawn to uh, counter anything that lands on that square. So for the foreseeable future, this G4 square is also going to be weak. So at its most fundamental form, this square here on E5 is a weakness for black. But a weakness is only a weakness as long as the opponent is able to use it to their advantage. So what should white do in order to take advantage of this weak square? they should use it to house their piece. In most cases, a knight is going to be the prime candidate for these squares, but occasionally bishops work as well, but you do need to be careful with the bishops potentially getting trapped because usually you also want to have these supported by your own pawns just to really reinforce the control of that square. So as an example, a white would want to put their pawns here to really reinforce this knight and just make sure it is not going anywhere and black's not going to easily be able to trade it off. The other important thing about these weak squares is that the further into your enemy's territory that this weakness is, the better it is for you. So for example, a weakness here on the sixth rank is going to be even better than one here on the fifth rank. And of course, your pieces all thrive in the center of the board because they're going to have more squares to control. So, you know, a weakness here in one of these center files is going to also be better than one over here on the edge of the board, for example. All right, another position here. Which square is the weakness currently? G4. Because this F pawn has pushed, and there was no H pawn to contest this. So this is the square that black may be trying to use at some point in the game. And you know, similarly, if the C pawn were to push, this D3 square would be weak. 
And if this g pawn were to be pushed, then this f3 square would be weak. Okay, so what is the significance of all of this? Let's look at a very famous example of a game that was completely decided by an outpost square. This is a game from the 1985 World Championship match between Kasparov and Karpov. Kasparov is playing black, and this entire game was decided by an outpost that Kasparov was able to secure. So I'm going to challenge you to look at this position. This is still pretty early on in the game, but at this point, Kasparov starts making moves that really signify he has his eye on this outpost square and he's going to do his best to try and secure it and use it to his advantage. So do you know what the square is? Again, uh, Kasparov is black here and uh, Karpov is white. D3. Why is this the square? It is on the sixth rank, which means it's an incredibly valuable square. It's deep into the enemy territory. It's in the middle of the board, so it's going to be a really, really strong place for Kasparov to use. And obviously, both of these pawns that would be able to refute any peace placement here have been pushed. So this is a long-term weakness that Kasparov is going to take advantage of. Okay, so at this point, this knight here on c6 is being attacked by the pawn. Where do you think Kasparov moves it? B4, eyeing this d3 square. Of course, it's not ready to go there at the moment. It needs to be prepared, but he already has this idea. So the knight is assembled where it's going to be able to jump there. And at the moment, as long as this knight here is here on a3, this knight on b4 is not going to be easily challenged. Okay, so game goes on. Bishop comes out to f5. And why do you think that this was the placement of the bishop? Obviously, it's the forward most available position you could put it, which makes it a strategically sound place to put the bishop anyway, but it's also eyeing this d3 square. And now, here we go. Knight goes to d3. Now, of course, Karpov's not going to sack his queen to get rid of this yet, but this knight is going to be a complete menace. It's going to be very annoying. And it's something that white constantly needs to be worrying about as the game goes on. So now this knight of Karpov's is very misplaced over on the side of the board. Of course, Kasparov's knight is just stunningly placed here at this weak square on the white side of the board. And here I just want to turn on the eval to show you that Karpov is actually up a pawn, but the eval gives Kasparov a 1.5 point advantage here just because of how positionally strong he is. Okay, here you can see Kasparov's really locking down the queen side, limiting white's activity. And here you can see we're almost at a three point advantage for Kasparov, despite being down in material, just because his position, his activity, if you remember my last video, activity being the most important part of positional chess, his activity is so strong and white's is so bad that there's a huge advantage towards black here. White's pieces are misplaced. They're not very active. I mean, some some have not developed at all. This pawn is just completely impeding this bishop. It's probably going to push soon. But you can just see material is not everything, guys. So white decides to trade off these pawns. D pawn gets pushed, activating the bishop. And at this point, black says, okay, let's just lock the king side down. We're clearly better positionally. There's no use in rushing some sort of attack. Let's just continue to improve our position. Okay, and so it begins. Now the queen is getting involved, assisting this knight. And you can see eval, almost five points to Gary. And again, this is just because when you have such a strong square that you're using, you have a piece there these combinations and tactics become sort of an entitlement at some point. You can kind of build up these positions and the attacks will be there. So if we look at Black's pieces right now, they are completely invading White's position. We have two open rook files looking here. The queen is now obviously checking the king over on Black's territory. This knight is just still a menace. Soon it's going to be cooperating with these other pieces. And our bishop is looking down here other knight comes in. Now it looks like Kasparov is hanging a knight here, but you can see the eval doesn't seem to care. 
see if you can figure out why we're not concerned about the knight on d3. Well, Karpov goes ahead and takes, and now we have knight f2, a discovery on the queen, a fork with the knight. Of course, you know, white can recapture, but black is going to be winning white's queen here. And again, it's just because the pieces were so well placed, this tactic was just kind of inevitable. And still Karpov continues to fight on, but the game is over. Mate is coming, so Karpov finally resigned. But this is just to illustrate how securing these weak squares in your opponent's territory can be the decider of the games. And that's why they are so important. So we understand what weak squares are. Now let's talk about how to secure them. We are going to look at another example. This time it's going to be Bobby Fisher versus, versus I'm probably going to mispronounce this, Alicio Gadia. This game was from 1960 at Mar del Plata. Let's just jump to kind of where stuff happened. Okay, so Bobby Fischer is playing white. Gadia is playing black. And keeping in mind this topic of outposts, see if you can guess what Bobby's move is going to be. As a hint, it seems kind of counterintuitive, but the idea is to provoke the weakening of a square. F5. He is asking questions of this e6 pawn, which is the key defender of this very strategically important d5 square. As we know, pawns are the main source of square weaknesses, so that is the place to start. He challenges this e pawn, which is defending this d5 square. And black pushes the pawn. And look at the eval, okay? Just by pushing this pawn, a seemingly harmless move. Okay, let's close the position. I'm not ready to open these lines with my king in the middle of the board. Gives white a whole 1.2 point advantage. All because this pawn push weakened this d5 square. So it's very clear what Bobby's plan is. He wants to secure this d5 square and use it to build up his attack and use it as an outpost for his pieces. Now we don't want to rush and say, oh, here's an outpost. Let's just go ahead and put our knight up here, which is something that I see a lot of players at my level uh, making and doing in these kinds of situations. We don't want to go ahead and do this because it will just be traded off. And after all of these exchanges, what have we gotten out of it? Nothing. But this is a permanent weakness, a static weakness that's going to be there for the rest of the game. So let's continue to develop and activate our pieces, and we will use this when the time is right. This bishop move, what do you think the point of this is? What is this knight doing? Protecting this d5 square. So white's already thinking about how he can remove some of the defenders of the square. Oh, there it goes. Trading a bishop for knight. Why would you do that? Because now this square has become even weaker. White has successfully removed one defender of the square, and there's still one other that needs to be taken care of. So what do you think white played in this position to fully secure this d5 square and remove the last defender? Bishop d5 attacking the last defender of this square. Black says, okay, you can take my bishop, but I'm going to be getting this knight file for my rook. Fisher says, okay. And now the d5 square is ready for the knight, but again, there's no need to rush. There are some other pieces that still have not become involved. So rook d1, and finally, knight d5 attacking the queen, and this knight is here to stay because all of the pieces that could have possibly removed this knight are gone. Both of Black's knights, the light squared bishop, and of course the pawns that could have protected the square have either been pushed or removed. So the knight is here to stay unless Black wants to sack the exchange. And we'll see, kind of similarly to the last game, now that he, White has this 
square secured, he can kind of just play safely. And you can see the eval is very much favoring white here. And as we saw in the last example, having these strong squares secured, having your pieces so well placed entitles you to combinations and tactics, which white has. Do you see a tactic here for white? Pause the video and see if you can figure it out. Knight takes e7. If you watched my video about identifying tactics, we see that there are two targets available in this position. We have a weak king and an undefended piece. If we could pick up the queen and put her anywhere on the board where she could attack both of these pieces, where would it be? This d5 square that we have secured with our knight. So we can play this clearance move, trading the knight with check, queen takes back, and now we can play queen d5 with check, therefore winning the rook, and at this point, black resigned. All right, so those are weak squares. That's how you can identify them, secure them, and use them to win your games. I hope this video was helpful for you. If it was, please go ahead and give it a thumbs up so I know to make more like this. And subscribe to the channel to join me on my chess improvement journey so we can all work on getting better together. And let me know in the comments if you guys have any requests for future videos. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.